Hello, everyone. My name is Cassie Hill, and I am Mohawk Bear from Six Nations of the Grand River. Welcome to the Indigenous Solidarity Conversation Series. Before commencing this speaking event today, I would like to begin by acknowledging our presence in Gadaraqui, which we now know as Kingston. And more specifically, I would like to acknowledge that we here at Queen's University are situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee land. In recognizing this land, we must recognize its history that predates the establishment of European colonial powers and the hardships, violence, and dispossession that my peoples experienced on this land and throughout much of Canada. Our ancestors faced such hardships to allow us to be here today and represents the continued resilience of Indigenous peoples. The traditional lands on which we study, work, and live today are sacred to the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and we are privileged to have the opportunity to be situated on this territory. It is integral for us to acknowledge our positionality on these traditional lands and the privileges we are granted through this, and to reflect on how we can work to meaningfully and respectfully engage with this land and the peoples of this land in all that we do. I would like to begin by saying a big Nyawa Goa thank you to our cultural performers, Thelma Peterson and Mouisa Mizin. The Indigenous Solidarity Conversation Series consists of four conversational talks. These talks will feature Ian Fanning speaking with invited guests on topic that, topics that explore Indigenous solidarity in various forms and the importance of such conversation at Queen's and in the wider community of Kingston and beyond. We will also examine how we as students, faculty, and members of our local community, Indigenous or not, can support Indigenous resistance and resurgence today. I am honored to be here today as your host. To tell a bit more about myself, I'm a third year Global Development Studies major at Queen's University, and I too am the co-president of the Queen's Native Student Association for the 2019-2020 school year. As a proud Indigenous woman, I am honored to be here today to be reclaiming mine and my people's power through education. In my studies and my involvement within the Indigenous community on campus and beyond, I am actively working to decolonize academia and to emphasize the importance of Indigenous narratives in settler discourse. I am passionate about education and hope through my initiatives that I can bring greater awareness to Indigenous history, the issues facing Indigenous communities across Canada, the beauty of Indigenous culture, and the resiliency of my peoples. I now would like to introduce Ian Fanning, who will be featured throughout all four of our conversational talks. Ian is a member of Shabbat Abadjuin Algonquin First Nation and is an instructor in Global Development Studies and in Arts and Science Online. Speaking with Ian today is Jan Hill. Jan is a mother, grandmother, and clan mother of the Turtle Clan Mohawk Nation at Tyndanaga. Jan has worked in the field of Indigenous education for more than 40 years. Jan currently serves as the Secretary of the Aboriginal Council of Queen's University. In the past, Jan has served as the co-chair of the Council of Ontario Universities, Reference Group on Aboriginal Education, the co-chair of the Joint Working Group of the Ontario Council of Academic Vice Presidents and the Reference Group, as well as serving as the member of the province's Indigenous Language Symposium Planning Committee. Before we begin with today's conversation, we do have a bit of housekeeping. Our hope in this series is to share our messages widely, so we encourage you to all take pictures and f videos as you wish. We do ask, though, that your phones remain on silent for the duration of this conversation. Today's talk will be approximately 40 minutes, and as the conversation comes to a close, we'll have a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period, where we will be accepting questions from the audience here today, as well as those watching from our live stream. Once the question and answer period is over, I will return to conclude today's conversation. Please note that the bathrooms are located out the doors to the right. And if you are in need of accommodations, please see Julia Sullivan. Can Julia please wave? She's over there. In the spirit of building solidarity and fostering an inclusive environment here on campus, in the broader Kingston community and beyond, we would like to acknowledge student-led groups on campus that have in the past and continue to build relationships with the Indigenous community. An example of this is the Queen's University Muslim Student Association, a group which has built relationships with the Queen's Native Student Association in the past and has actively worked to educate, support, and stand in solidarity with Indigenous peoples. Groups such as CUMSA and other clubs here on campus represent allyship and inclusion at its finest, 
and such relationships are incredibly valuable, not only to the groups involved, but to the ongoing work we all are doing to support Indigenous resistance and resurgence across campus and beyond. The topics addressed throughout this speaker series are brought forth to raise awareness and to promote Indigenous resistance and resurgence. Some topics addressed may be upsetting to some, and because of this, we will be offering a smudge at the end of today's conversation. Smudging involves the burning of our four traditional medicines, cedar, sage, sweetgrass, and tobacco, which have been gifted to us by our Mother Earth. We burn this medicine in a shell, and as smoke is produced, we wash ourselves in it. To do this, we use our hands to waft the smoke onto us. In traditional Indigenous beliefs, smudging purifies and cleanses our minds and souls, allowing us to rid ourselves of negative thoughts and energies. Indigenous and non-Indigenous people are welcome to partake in this smudge. Al Doxator from the Office of Indigenous Initiatives will be offering this, and you can help yourself to it at the end of our talk. If you have any sensitivities to scent or smoke, there is an alternative exit available out those doors. <coughs> After our conversation here today, there will be a brown bag conversation in this exact room beginning at 12 p.m. The topic being discussed is student perspectives on decolonization. As we continue to have these discussions here today, we urge you to take part in others as well and continue to educate yourself on resistance, resurgence, and decolonization. I would also like to make mention of an upcoming event. On Wednesday, March 4th, Ellen Gabriel, a Gunyit Gahaga human rights and environmental rights activist, will be providing a public lecture on the ongoing land struggle of Gunyit Gahaga of Ganesadage. This event will take place at the University Club from 1 to 2.30 p.m., and in addition to this, there is also a walkout being planned on Queen's campus beginning at noon, where students are urged to gather, rally, and walk together in solidarity to the Ellen Gabriel talk. Thank you, and without further ado, I would like to welcome Ian Fanning and Jan Hale to begin our conversation. Well, uh, thank you, Cassie, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, everybody hear me okay? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Now? Better? Um, Jim Miigwech, everybody, for coming. Uh, really glad to see the room uh, full again. And uh, Goa Jan, for coming. Um, just ask uh, everyone be, to be a little maybe gentle with us today, uh, <laughs> considering what's uh, going on. Um, so, Jan, really honored to be sitting here with you. We've known each other for a while and uh, really, really thankful for our relationship and uh, getting to know you better as, uh, as time unfolds. Um, a lot of people know you fairly well around Queens and around uh, your home territory and, and, and you know, around uh, different places. But for those who don't, I just invite you to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, who you are, where you come from. Okay. Um... So Sego Sewa Gwego, Wat Kwanu Horado, Ganu Shuni, Yungat, Waganyahtu, Dano Ganyungehaga, um Garakwine, Catherine Brand, Kunha, Yun Dudget, Sne Age Nistoha, Dano Lennox Hill, Rumwa Goha, Rumwayat, Sne Rage Niha, Waganyatu, Dano Ganyungehaga, Niwa Gunhoju, Gundege, Nido Wagenu, Gundege Gunagare. So Ganoshuni means she's making a house, and that's my traditional name. It was given to me by a clan mother in consultation with my sisters. It's very meaningful to me because it's really been the work of my life. And that's the intent of our names. Our traditional names is to help provide guidance for us in our lives. So I've built many houses, or I'm in the process of building many houses. <coughs> One of the things I always say is the house that I pay the least amount of attention to that's probably the most important is this house. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> without this house, I can't do anything else. <clears throat> my deceased mother was Catherine Hill. Um, my deceased father was Lennox Hill. He was Wolf Clan. I'm uh, Turtle Clan. In, our, in the Mohawk Nation, we're matrilineal, so we follow our lineage through our mother. So I'm turtle because my mother was and her mother was and her mother was and so on. And my children are turtle because they're my children, but my dad was wolf. So 
in a more formal introduction, I would talk to you about my family, my children, my grandparents, my great grandparents going back so that you know who I am and where I come from. I've been taught that it's important for me to position myself so that you know where I'm speaking from and what my positionality is. My sisters have done a lot of research and uh, they've researched that my family is Mohawk at least six generations back and we can trace our ancestry back to the Mohawk Valley. Um, So as you heard from Cassie, I'm also the sitting, um, seat, actually seat warming clan mother of the Dagari Hogum family of the Turtle Clan in Tayendinega. And I sit there at the request of the clan. That's how clan mothers are appointed is by their clan. And it's a lifetime appointment. So I, when I was approached and asked to be the clan mother, I was very young. It's usually something reserved for women who are much older who've already finished raising their families and who um, are free to do the work of the people. But because of the situation that all of our communities are in, there weren't a lot of women with that, those qualifications at the time we were looking for a clan mother. And so um, I was only 29 years old and uh, I was a single mom. and. But I was asked to hold the seat because I carried more knowledge than a lot of other people did. I agreed to hold the seat until somebody came along who was more qualified because I don't speak the language. And for me, I think you need to speak the language to really do this job well. So um, that's, that's still part of my learning plan <laughs> is to learn the language, but it's been like over 30 years now. <laughs> Um, so also here at Queen's, I'm the Associate Vice Principal, Indigenous Initiatives and Reconciliation. And that's a position I've held here since November 2018. Prior to that, I was the Director of Indigenous Initiatives for a year. And prior to that, I was the Director of the Four Directions Indigenous Student Center for seven years. <laughs> And I've held various positions here at Queen's since 1988. I left for 10 years but to do work in my home community, but then I came back in 2010. Um, I, I, as you heard, I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, I'm an auntie, I'm a sister, all those things. I'm also a learner. I'm doing a master's degree here, so, because you know, got all kinds of spare time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe we could talk uh, later in the talk. Maybe if we have time about your work, because it's it's really interesting what you're what you're working on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you, you filled us in a little bit about what you do here at Queens, but I know you've had a lot of involvement in Indigenous solidarity generally here at the university and at outside as well. I know you have you know you have sort of a whole another life outside of Queens, <laughs> and uh, I know you've uh, you had a really important role or roles at, at First Nations Technical Institute uh, on your territory. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your work in Indigenous solidarity generally here at Queens, but outside of Queens as well. Okay, well, um, I grew up in Tyendinaga, so I was really naive and led a pretty sheltered life until I was about 19. And I left to go, you know, go to university and I went to Trent. So Trent was a wonderful place to go and become educated about the world and to learn <coughs> about the situation of Indigenous people. And it was during my time there that my eyes were opened and my awake, I say my awakening happened. I became more aware of the oppression of Indigenous people and the plight of colonization and government policy and all those, all those things, you know, all the things that affect our lives as Indigenous people. So I really became active at that time and <laughs> some would say unfortunately my academics suffered a little bit because I became very involved politically and socially at that time because of my own awakening. Um, so that started in about 1978. Just a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't even know about 1978, <laughs> most of you. <laughs> um, yeah, and a lot of things were happening to us as Indigenous students at the time, like um, there were a lot of protests happening against 
proposed cuts to post-secondary education funding. Mm -hmm. People were still reacting to the white paper. Mm -hmm. um, there were ongoing talks with people. At, uh, at then, it, then it was the National Indian Brotherhood, which became the um, Assembly of First Nations. So there was a lot of involvement in, across the province and across the country with Indigenous youth mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, we worked with different organizations, Native women, but also Ontario Native Counseling Association, a lot of the people who were holding up Indigenous students and supporting us in our fight for our rights. And so that was really the beginning for me. Um, one of the things that uh, I also came to learn when I was away at school was about our culture and history as Ganyankeaga, because I grew up as a Christian. I grew up in the Anglican church and in my community. At that time, we didn't have a longhouse and we didn't have a lot of people who knew about the culture and the traditions. We had speakers though, which is one good thing Unfortunately, now we don't. Um, we don't have any mother tongue speakers left in Thai and Denega, although we have a growing community of second language speakers and we have a huge, uh, we have an organization and a really strong community dedicated to the revitalization of our language in our community. And that really has been my life work is to hold up the language and the culture and the traditions. Because I didn't learn those things as a child and growing up, um, and when I did start learning those things, that's where I drew my strength. So then it became my goal to make sure that those opportunities were available for young people coming behind me, that they wouldn't have to wait until they were already grown up. To learn those things. So um, it took me a really long time to finish my undergrad, <laughs> like 12 years. <laughs> because <laughs> I took a time out, I went and worked and I was involved in solidarity work. So as you said, it's been an, it's really been my life. Um, and most of it's been around language and culture, but uh, um, it's been engagement with all of the struggles you mentioned, I know, in the write up for these solidarity talks about all the struggles that our peace, peoples have faced over time. And at, at one point or another in some way, shape or form, I've been involved with many of those things. Um, <clears throat> uh, I worked with the Métis um, and non-status Indians in Saskatchewan for several years, and I actually learned a great deal from them. They were amazing at organizing and engaging with government and lobbying and advocacy work. So my work with them was really um, in, instrumental in my development, I think. Um, I remember I was a young woman when I was in Saskatchewan and I was at the point where I just didn't want to be involved anymore with politics. I, I was with my boss at the time who was a big white guy <laughs> and he took me out for lunch and said, asked me what was wrong because he knew I wasn't quite right at the time and I just said, I don't want to be political anymore. I don't want to be involved in the politics anymore. I just want to do this or that. And he just burst out laughing and said, Jan, you were born an Indian. You were born political. And that's the truth. Being born Ngwehunwe, Anishinaabe, we're born as political beings. We can't not be political. And what's happening today is evidence of that. We can't get away from it. I still try <laughs> sometimes to take a break. You need to take a break. But we always have to be aware of who we are and where we are in this country and what's happening to all of us, all of our people. And be mindful of our roles and our responsibilities within our family, within our clan, within our nation, and within the broader world. Um, so, I got lost. Okay. <laughs> but my work has not only been with within Canada, it's been international as well. Especially while I was at First, First Nations Technical Institute, I was responsible for putting FNTI through an accreditation process for World Indigenous um, Accreditation. So we became part of the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium. So that was Indigenous people globally who came together in an organization and were working to raise each other up and hold each other up 
and recognize and acknowledge our own knowledge ways, our ways of knowing and being and legitimizing them for each other. And so they, through WinHEC, they developed this accreditation process and we developed relationships with the Sami, with um, Native Hawaiians, with um, the Maori, with indigenous Aboriginal people from Australia, um, uh, people in Taiwan, indigenous people in Taiwan and Japan. So we met people from all over the world and we developed relationships with them and we learned from each other and we supported each other in our work. So I've kind of continued that work because now at Queen's I'm involved with the Matariki Indigenous Student Mobility Program and that's a program for indigenous students um, that partners with Otago in New Zealand, uh, University of Western Australia, uh, Dartmouth in the United States, and Queen's. And I think there's one more that I'm forgetting. <laughs> there's other universities that are part of Matariki, but the Indigenous Student Mobility section of the Matariki project is just for Indigenous learners, so we'd only partner with the universities that have an Indigenous population. We're trying to encourage um, um, Tubingen, is it Tubingen? Or, no, Uppsala, because we believe there's a Sami population there, but apparently they have not been engaging. The university hasn't been engaging with the Sami population, so we're encouraging that engagement so the Sami can then be part of our group as well. And um, so then here, I came here, I came back here. I've come and gone and come back again. And uh, all of my work here, my goals, the goals of my work here have always been about raising up Indigenous people, raising up Indigenous ways of knowing and being, increasing our visibility, increasing the understanding and awareness of the Indigenous pre presence in Canada. Um, I believe that Ca Queen's is a place that graduates leaders, policy makers, decision makers, and I think that we do our country and ourselves and the world a disservice if students leave here without knowledge of their relationships with Indigenous people, historical and current. Um, again, as evidenced by what's going on in our country right now, I see a lot of ignorance, especially, I know you're not supposed to read the comments, but you get sucked right into those comments. <laughs> but there's lots of, um, there's a lot of ignorance and I think it's a part of education to um, address that, to redress that, because uh, it's like what Senator Marie Sinclair said, you know, education got us into this mess and it really is what's going to get us out because I think the only way to combat ignorance is through education. And so that's really why I chose as a young woman to work in the field of education and to become educated in the field of education because I felt like that was a place where change could be made. <laughs> um, you talked about your goals a little bit, and I wonder, um, you, you touched on it near the end of your answer uh, as, as a young woman. Uh, I wonder if, um, from the perspective uh, specifically as, as an Indigenous woman, as a Mohawk woman, and I'm thinking a little bit about your grad work, actually, mm -hmm. um, sort of how, how does your identity as a Mohawk woman inform your goals and inform your academic work? Um, being Mohawk, being a Mohawk woman informs everything I do. Mm -hmm. It's who I am. It's the foundation of who I am. I'm a clan mother in the longhouse. That also informs who I am and what I do and the way that I relate to people, the way that I build relationships. Our way, the way of the longhouse is a way of, uh, of consensus building and relationship building. And so my work has always been about building relationships um, and working to achieve consensus. Mm -hmm. If anybody has, is familiar with any of my working groups or wants to be, you're welcome <laughs> if you're not currently. But uh, you'll know that any of the work that's done in any of the working groups that I work with, it's always by consensus. Um, I guess it's important for people to understand consensus too mm -hmm. though, right? Because consensus doesn't necessarily mean that we all agree. In my understanding of consensus, though, what it means is that we all have a voice. We all have an opportunity to say what we need to say. We all have the right to be heard and listened to. And so in my understanding of consensus building, everyone is encouraged to have a voice. 
everyone is encouraged to be heard. And, but sometimes we have to agree to disagree, and sometimes we have to think of the greater good, and as individuals we have to make a decision about whether we, I need to fight about this thing right now, or whether this really isn't the point right now. The point is this bigger thing that mm -hmm. we need to work towards, or we need to work on, or we need to push forward. And for this moment in time, I'm willing to set this aside for the greater good and so that we can move that forward. Mm -hmm. As a clan mother, uh, I was taught once by an, by an old clan mother that as a Mohawk woman and a clan mother, everything inside this circle is my responsibility. What she said was everything from birth to death is the responsibility of the women. And so in my understanding of our world, everything inside of our communities is the responsibility of the women. Everything on the outside is the responsibility of the men. Not to say that the men don't have responsibilities inside, but that's the women's domain. But the men do help. I mean, we're about equality, um, not about one being more than the other. Mm -hmm. And there have been people who have understood our matriarchy to be that the women are the boss. Well, we kind of are, but... <laughs> 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 but men have an equal voice in many things, right? So the social fabric of our communities, our, our uh, even the uh, food sovereignty, um, our ceremonies, our children, all of those things are the responsibility of the women. And so... Um, I decided to do a master's degree a few years ago, more years ago than I'd like to count right now because it's taken me a long time. <laughs> um, and part of it was because of the work that I do at the university, I wanted to have a better understanding of academ academia and academic language and how to speak the, the speak. And so all of my previous education was in the field of education. And I know if I'd have done a master's of education, I'd have been done three years ago. <laughs> But I didn't. I chose to go into the field. I went into gender studies. My original intent was to look at the continuity of women's knowledge from the time of our Sky Woman to the present. Um, but then I started my program and I started my coursework. And my, one of my first courses was my uh, theory course, and it was queer theory. Yeah. Kind of blew my mind. I was like, I'd never heard of queer theory before. When I was doing my undergrad, where there was we'd only just started having women's studies programs, <laughs> Never, let alone gender studies or queer studies. And I'd always understood queer to be a derogatory term. I know it's not now; it's reclaimed. And so, but I asked permission to use that term. But I took my queer theories course, and my professor was Catherine McKittrick. And if anybody here has an opportunity to teach with, or to learn with Professor McKittrick, I strongly encourage it because she, like, blew my socks off <laughs> <laughs> and really opened up my eyes. And it just so happened that while I was doing that course, it was time to have our... We were in the middle of harvest ceremonies. So I was sitting in the longhouse, and I was looking around at who was there and who wasn't there. And I knew that there were people in our community who were two-spirit, who identified as two-spirit. So I was thinking about where they were sitting and whether they were comfortable where they were sitting. And I was thinking about the roles they were expected to fulfill and wondering if they were comfortable fulfilling those roles or if they'd rather be doing different work. Because the longhouse is very gendered as it is right now. It has a woman's door, a men's door. We've got women's benches and men's benches. We have a women's fire and a men's fire. And within the longhouse and within our ceremonies, the things that people do are very gendered. Who has the responsibility to speak or to sing or to do whatever is also very gendered. So. I changed up my whole <laughs> grad proposal to then look at the place of gender within the longhouse. And uh, it was very, uh, it's kind of cutting edge, I think. It's very challenging um, because the way the longhouse exists right now it has existed this way since the late 1700s. So for me to be challenging this is kind of huge. Um, I decided to focus my research on Tayan Danega because it's manageable, mm -hmm. and I decided to do interviews. So I interviewed people who identified as LGBTQ two spirit to get. Uh, I wanted to understand from them things around belonging, inclusion, 
um, and how they felt about being a part of the Longhouse community. And so the biggest thing was about belonging and inclusion for me when I started the research. But as I did the interviews, what became more apparent, what became more evident, and what became um, what, what I saw as more important to them was the questioning about roles and responsibilities and who does what and why right. and where does that come from. So that's kind of how I am now, I'm writing now, finally. <laughs> and uh, that's what's coming out of the evidence I've seen. But I was, um, I mean, you know, when you're doing research, especially with human beings, you have to do ethics. And um, I had to acknowledge my own privilege and I have a lot of privilege. Um, I have the privilege evident here. I mean, I'm a senior administrator at a university. There's not a lot of Mohawk women who are senior administrators <laughs> at universities. Um, I, yeah. have, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, have, um, I have a good life. I have a home and for my family and the community, um, but also being a clan mother in the longhouse. Mm -hmm. But one of the people I interviewed <clears throat> told me they were happy that it was me doing the research. They said, I'm happy that it's you because you're recognized as a leader in the Longhouse and because we trust you. Mm -hmm. They knew that um, as a clan mother, my responsibility is to always make sure everyone's safe, you know, mm -hmm. to ensure the least amount of risk possible. So mo the people who agreed to speak with me agreed partially based on that because mm -hmm. they knew who I was as a human being, but also as a clan mother. And they knew that I was coming at this from a good place, and that my intent, what I've, um, what one of the things Catherine asked me once early on was whether this, my research was an intervention in the longhouse. And I'd never thought about it that way before. I have since. <laughs> I think it possibly is an intervention in the longhouse, but I think about an intervention for what? And at first I wondered if it was an intervention to bring the longhouse into the 21st century. And do I need to ask the clan mothers and the faith keepers and the chiefs to rethink about what we do and why we do it and can we think about doing it a different way? But I've also come to think that perhaps it's an intervention to return us to our authenticity. Rather than change, go back to who we are meant to be. Because um, we're on Guajue. Everybody who I talk to, elders, anybody, we're on Guajue, which means we're human beings. And we're on Guajue above all else, whether we're queer, whether we're trans, whether we're bi, whether we're two-spirit, that really doesn't matter. What matters is that we're on Guajue. And what matters is our clan and what clan we sit with, so that determines our work. And what matters is our gifts, the gifts that we're born with, because those come from Songwai Abisong. They come from the Creator. And I've been taught as a clan mother and a woman that part of my responsibility is to watch those little ones when they're growing up because you watch them for what their gifts are and you encourage and you, and you promote that gift and you help them develop that gift. And it doesn't matter if they're man or woman or trans. What matters is the gift, mm -hmm. that they're human beings and what clan they sit in because that determines how they engage with the rest of the community and the world around them. Yeah. Beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so much there again. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I just sort of checkmarked in my head uh, education. You talked about education. You've talked about Indigenous youth. Uh, and something sort of came to mind. Um, you know, some a lot of the content in my classes is, you know, it's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy stuff. And, um, you know, sometimes I feel like, wow, if I was a student in my class, I'd be kind of like drained, you know, uh, going out and, and not even as an Indigenous person. Um, but I do tell my students, um, I'm really glad you're engaging in this because I think education is key. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're here taking Indigenous courses is is a sign of hope for me yeah. anyway. Um, I still see and hear things around campus that are troublesome and I... Um, sort of turn to your comments about relationship. So I'm just, just sort of want to ask you probably as a last question, um, why is indigenous, why are efforts to include indigenous people still necessary at Queens? Why is indigenous solidarity still necessary at Queens? Well, I think I touched on this a little bit. Um, 
it's combating ignorance. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's really important. Um, I too am troubled by what I see on our campus, especially this year, um, more than ever mm -hmm. since I've been here. And I don't know if I had rose colored glasses on before mm -hmm. and I just didn't see, mm -hmm. but it, it's hard to not see right now what's happening on campus. And I think what's happening on campus is, a reflect, is reflected in what's happening across the country right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important, <laughs> it's important for human, it's important for the world to see us as human beings. The government and the law in this country didn't even see us as human beings until very recently in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were bounties on our scalps. Um, it, it, uh, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. All those things, you know, people believed those things because we were less than murdered and missing indigenous women were disposable. Um, the residential schools, the 60s scoop, um, even child protective services still can take our children because we're not human beings. We don't know how to look after our own, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. Those attitudes are still pre prevalent in this country and the world and they're not true. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important for all of us to become educated. It's, um, and part of the problem is you can't, I mean, what is it? It's like singing to the choir. Mm -hmm. All of you are probably already allies or supporters in some way, shape or form. And I appreciate that and I value that. But it's the people who are not in this room who need to hear these things, who need to learn these things and who need to become supportive of our struggles. So I think, and sometimes it has to come from you. It can't come from us. I remember uh, Clearing the Plains, who wrote that book? Oh, it's not a test. <laughs> but there was, <laughs> there was an author who came to talk about his book, and he was a non-native scholar who wrote a book about um, yeah. the starvation policies in the prairies, and he presented to a group there, and he was, uh, he was telling me the story, and he said, over in the corner was a whole bunch of old indigenous women, and he was terrified because of the work he was presenting and the pushback that he might get from them, and when he was done his talk, somebody came and said to him, the women would like to talk to you. <laughs> and he was like, oh my God. <laughs> but he went over and he talked to them and what they said to him was, thank you. Thank you for writing this book and thank you for telling this story and thank you for telling the world about what happened to us because people will listen to you because you're a white man. They won't listen to us as indigenous women, especially, or as indigenous people. They'll just say, Oh, it's just them complaining again. Oh, it's just them whining again. It's just them whatever again. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to, right? It's just us again, complaining, whining. Yeah. But it's not, you mm -hmm. know? It's very valid, these things that are happening in our country right now. And it's really important for everybody to be educated on the history of why we are in the position that we're in right now. The true history, you know, not the history you learned in grade three or grade six, because you probably didn't get a very accurate picture and maybe it was like 20 minutes. So what are you supposed to learn as a 12 year old in 20 minutes about indigenous people in Canada? Canada had a golden opportunity on Friday mm -hmm. to walk their talk. The prime minister knew before his press release that the the gas link pipeline environmental assessment was denied mm -hmm. and that they were put on a 30 day moratorium, yep. no work, had to withdraw. That was a golden opportunity to pull out the RCMP and to, to have the discussions and dialogue with the wet sewer and hereditary chiefs. Mm -hmm. Did they do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, <Yeah. laughs> he had a press conference where he incited more hate. Yeah. He incited more hate. He said that he was tired of things. He was tired of talking, which was a load of crap because he never talked yeah. to anybody. Yeah. Um, ooh, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> 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 but it's the truth, you know? We have to speak our truth no matter how 
painful it might be or how much people don't want to hear it. Yeah. But we can speak our truth in kindness. We don't have to speak our truth in violence or anger, even though it's hard sometimes to not be angry. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to speak truth and to know that at the same time they were arresting the defenders in Tyendinaga, they were arresting Gitscan hereditary chiefs and invading again Wet'suwet'en territory. After all the talk about reconciliation and all the talk about wanting to do right in this country, it just flabbergasts me. Mm -hmm. I have worked my whole life to try and make things better. Mm -hmm. Sometimes at the expense of my family. Mm -hmm. Because when you become a clan mother, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to the people. And so if I get called in the middle of the night and I have to go to a meeting in Montreal because the army's moving into Gunasadage, then I had to wrap up my baby and drop him off at somebody and say, sorry, I gotta go, and I, there I went. You know? So my sons have been raised by my family and my community, and I'm thankful for that. But I missed it because of my work. And yesterday I felt like I got slapped in the face. Yeah. No, punched in the stomach mm -hmm. <laughs> more than slapped in the face. And the re hateful reactions of Canada. Um, and they have no understanding. I don't know what else to do. So I call on all of you to step up and do this work, to learn, to become educated, to educate those around you, to support. And if you want to support Indigenous people, to talk to them and ask how they need your support, if they want your support, because that's part of the danger sometimes is we get all zealous and we want to help and that's yeah. great, yeah. but don't know when to stand up and step back and know when not to take up space that rightfully belongs to Indigenous people mm -hmm. and make that space for that to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's time to open up uh, a few for a few questions uh, for Jan. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> you can ask me anything, really. <laughs> oh, I made everybody sad now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you got a question over there. Over here, Kettles. How can, how can we help? Oh. How can we help? with um, what's happening with the RCMP and um, how can we um, help as allies um, with the government to get the government not to do the things that they're doing <laughs> right now in this situation? Is there something we can do to help, we in this room can do to help? So the question is how can people in this room help with the situation right now and what's happening with the RCMP and the government? Um, that's a pretty hard question. Um, I think I think it comes down to what I said earlier. It's about raising awareness. It's about standing in solidarity. It's about standing in support. Um, I never encourage anyone to put themselves in harm's way. Sometimes we can't help that. My sons went out to the demonstration last night, and the last thing I always say to them is, you know, be safe. You know, and they both said, we know, Mom, we're there in peace. We're not there to instigate trouble. But if somebody else starts... <laughs> <laughs> and my boys are really big. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's an important lesson, is that we need... I mean, our teaching as teachings as Zungwe Hume, my teachings as a Ganyon Kehaga woman is peace, power, and righteousness. Always to approach things with a good mind 
And so that's what I encourage people is to approach things with a good mind, to do the work in peace, um, to hold your ground and your power. Um, but it's, again, supporting, standing in solidarity, making your voice be heard, right? Um, I think it's important for non-Indigenous people to have their voices be heard, especially as you raise your own awareness and become educated because, again, it can't just come from us. Are there initiatives on campus that people can get involved in? I believe there are. Cassie named a few at the beginning of the talk. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what else is going on right now. I probably do know, but yeah. Yeah, there's a teach-in at the Faculty of Ed at 5:30 on Thursday. And that, and people, all people are invited. And if you have a drum, bring your drum, and you can sing and dance. But there will be speakers as well. Um, can I just invite people to come here because I'm a little wired now? So if you want a question, come on. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I know that there's a fire burning at Four Directions all day today from 10 until 4, 4.30. So people who want to go and burn tobacco or spend some time in community at the fire, people are welcome to do that. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Ian, um, for this conversation. Um, I wonder, it's, it's wonderful to have you in the senior administration. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, kind of lost all uh, attachment to the word reconciliation right now. <laughs> um, trying uh, This morning I was thinking, how can I take that off my title? <laughs> um, um, my colleague Kim Anderson at the University of Guelph talks about the fact that reconciliation is about land, language, and kinship. So I think, and my colleague Ellen Gabriel, who will be here next week, talks about the fact that reconciliation requires restitution. And so I don't know how we'll bring those things into effect here. We've been working towards that. Um, it's, it's kind of my overarching vision. We talk about land, language, and kinship in the things we're developing. One thing Mark Dockstader said to me, who's the new fellow at policy studies, is when he was the president of First Nations University, students came to him and said, it needs to be more than faces, places, and spaces. It can't just be hiring more Indigenous people, hanging up Indigenous art, and making a room, <laughs> creating an Indigenous space. Although when we are creating Indigenous spaces, it's important that they are Indigenous spaces, that they're spaces that are safe for Indigenous people to take part in our our cultural and traditional practices. We need dedicated space where we can go anytime and smudge. That's something to think about. That we don't have to call ahead to health and safety 48 hours and say, I want to have a smudge. Because sometimes, like today, we really need a smudge, like right now. <laughs> and I don't have time to phone health and safety to get permission to do a smudge. So we need spaces on campus that are safe for that all the time. I think for me, it's also looking at what we do here systemically. It's looking at barriers. What barriers are there that exist full part, that exist that prevent the full participation of Indigenous people? And what are the barriers that exist, you know, that hamper our ability to be who we are um, at any time? I am very proud of who I am. I've always been very proud of who I am. 
I, it breaks my heart to know that there are students and staff and faculty on this campus who don't feel safe to identify who they are because they don't feel this is a, spa a safe community. And I have to tell you this year, I don't think it's a safe community. I think we all need a lot of, to do a lot of work around racism. Mm -hmm. Racism is like huge here. The undercurrent culture in this community blows my mind. I can't believe how hateful some of the stuff is that goes on in this community on this campus. And I can't believe that I'm only just now learning about it. And I've been here for 30 years. And I've asked students, has it always been like this? And they're like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but nobody talked about it because of fear, I think, right? So it needs to be safe and we need to combat racism. And I think the way we do that is by raising up ways of knowing and being. And I know that's a large part of what Ian works towards in his work and the Center for Teaching and Learning works towards is raising up Indigenous ways of knowing and being as valid, you know, as valid ways and as, as perhaps alternatives to how to see the world and how to engage. I think it's really important to build relationships across every sector of the university. Um, like Cassie also talked about the relationship with QNSA and the Muslim students. Those kinds of relationships are really important, especially for other marginalized communities. Um, Although there are students I know who have come here whose parents have discouraged them from identifying or from being part of the living, learning, what do I mean? Living and learning community because they didn't want them to become targets. And that's exactly what happened this year. They became targets. And that breaks my heart because I'm so proud of who I am and I want them to be proud of who they are. And I want them to be able to stand up in that and not be attacked. because no one has the right to attack who I am or where I come from. It's who I am, it's where I come from. If you don't agree with it, fine, that's your business. Leave me alone then, go do your own thing. <laughs> don't be violent, you know, don't, don't be hateful. Yeah, I just think we need to do a lot of work around building a better, safe, inclusive community. Yeah, go ahead, Jan. Um, uh, we're uh, out of time. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I want to uh, just personally thank the Tyendinaga Land Defenders and uh, just to go off uh, some of Jan's comments um, about how to support. Um, you know, I, I've spent a very limited amount of time over there, but maybe consider going over and talking to them, getting to know them a little bit. Uh, those uh, people on the front lines are... are putting their bodies at risk and, and they're doing the hard work and uh, having a conversation with them, getting to know them a little bit and uh, what they've been through and, uh, and the, um, the, the resiliency required to stand uh, strong on, on the protest line. So I'd like to thank them personally. I just would like to make one comment and that is that uh, they are defenders, but there never was a blockade. Mm -hmm. I, I hate that they've been using that word in the media, blockade, because there never yeah. was a blockade ever in Tyndanaga. <clears throat> there were camps set up beside the tracks, but they never blocked the tracks. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that people understand that, mm -hmm. you know, and they actually were back, you know, those things that come down, they were behind those things, but because of train protocol, I guess, <laughs> they wouldn't send the trains through because they said the people were too close to the tracks. Mm -hmm. But there never was a blockade. There never was anything on the tracks. Mm -hmm. And I, I want people to know that and understand that. Mm -hmm. And um, Christy Belcour has been there for two weeks. She's been instrumental in helping with media. Um, so if anybody follows her on Twitter or Facebook, she re I've found that she really has the most up-to-date information so if you want to know what's going on, um, check out her Facebook tweet, tweet feed or her Twitter feed. 
and also real people media wow. um, has a lot. Tony of, was whispering it to me, and, and you, you beat her to it. <laughs> real people media has a lot of um, video. If you want to look at their website as well. Great. Now I'll go uh, mm-hmm. bottom of my heart, Dan. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Cassie, can you close us? Mm-hmm. Niawagoa, thank you so much, Ian and Jan, for a great conversation. Um, and thank you as well to our cultural performers, Thelma and Muiza. And thank you to Al Doxater for providing us with this much. Thank you all for being here today as well and for being a part of this conversation. Thank you for the work you all are doing to further Indigenous solidarity. Um, thank you to all of you here today in Mitchell Hall. And thank you as well, those watching online and those listening to CFRC. Your participating in the Indigenous Solidarity Conversation Series is greatly appreciated, and we encourage you to continue educating yourselves. I would also like to acknowledge the Principal's Dream Course and funding provided by the Committee of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Indigeneity, for without these two avenues, this conversation series would not be possible. I had prepared a long speech about Wet'suwet'en, but I think you both really put it eloquently and really expressed um, the need for everybody to stand up right now and get involved and I know that the Four Directions page is a great source for getting your information and there's so much um, activity on Facebook right now that's where a lot of the information comes from Um, with the the, uh, teach-in that's coming up, the Ellen Gabriel talk, the rallies that are organized. There's great ways to get involved on campus and as you both were saying, going to Tynanaga and standing with them Um, talking to the defenders and just educating yourself and you know the everything that's going on the government has really showed their true colors Um, it's evident that the companies are prioritizing profit over our lives over human rights and this is of course an indigenous issue but it's a human issue we all land is sacred to all of us without land we don't have life Without water, we do not have life. So it's something that you have to think of as a universal issue for us all. And for true allyship, you must we must all stand together. So Indigenous peoples, we're putting in this work, but it's very difficult for us too. So it is important for everybody, and especially settlers, to use their privilege and to use their voice to stand up, to educate yourself, um, and to condemn the government and the companies that are doing this to indigenous peoples in Wet'suwet'en and in Tainanega, because we are not protesting, we're defending, and we're not a violent peoples, but they show that that's the only way that they will negotiate is through violence. So um, please get involved and please educate yourself and continue to stand in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en and with Tainanega and everybody else across Turtle Island that has stood up in solidarity. Um, Our next speaker series will take place on March 10th and will feature Robin Addis, who will be speaking on becoming a settler ally. Tickets are going very quickly and they're available via Eventbrite, so I definitely encourage you to get those tickets, especially with what is going on right now. Again, Nyawagoa, thank you all for today.